36 years, I used living history in the classroom to lure my students into liking the subject of history and realizing that it's actually pretty cool, that it's a lot better than just simply identifying famous dead people in the back of the book. And to that end, I would dress the part for whatever time period we were uh, covering, and I would have the music going in the background, and I'd bring in artifacts for the uh, students to handle, because some people learn better that way. I was one of those annoying people in school, and it, you know, the people in museums hated me showing up, and I wanted to make it a kid-friendly experience. But I'm not in the classroom anymore, so I repurposed myself. I've been doing history videos, trying to bring the subject to life the way I did in the class, only I get to have the advantage of traveling around. And I have a very pretentious mission odyssey going where I actually did cover all 23 of the missions and 11 assistencias and five presidios, and I told the stories of these places while I was in garb. And that sounds like that should be the end of it, except it's not. There was also Spain's and Mexico's rival in Northern California, the Russian Empire. So what I have decided to do is continue my mission odyssey by visiting Russian California. And I've already been telling the story in a couple of videos but there's so much stuff, I figured I've got to try to cover the subject all the way. So, I hope you stick with me as I travel around Fort Ross and Bodega Bay. And freak out people that are going to be staring at the guy in uh, funny clothes. So, stick with me. Ooh, the mothership. In 1812, Ivan Kuskov returned to the area and he was going to select a permanent site for the capital of the colony. And he took a look at Puerto Rubianzov or Bodega Bay and decided too close to the Spanish, too susceptible to attack. So what he did upon uh, speaking with the Kashaya Pomo is they directed him further up the coast and he selected this place, which had a small cove. There's trees nearby for lumbering needs. And he named the fort in honor of Russia. You know, the old word for Russian. And in time, this is going to devolve to Fort Ross, even though they always call it Settlement Ross or something that was less militaristic. And the Russians were going with the idea of, no, 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 this was not about conquest. So words are important, words are loaded. And in order to secure the site from the Kashaya Pomo, um, Kuskov paid them like three blankets, three pairs of pants, um, a couple of axes, some other farm implements, some beads, and the deal was done. Kashaya Pomo called the Russians the undersea people. I think that came from the appearance or the illusion of the ships seeming to come out of the water as they neared the land. They referred to themselves as people from the top of the land, and they regarded the Russians as much more desirable neighbors than the Spanish or the Mexicans. The Battle of Sitka changed the RAC's attitude towards native populations, viewing them as business partners. And in the company's regulations was written such things as, since the main object of the company is hunting land and marine animals, and since there is no need for the company to extend its sway into the interior lands, the company should make no efforts at conquest of the peoples inhabiting the shores. The company is forbidden from demanding from these people any kind of tribute, tax, fur tribute, etc. A treaty with Kashaya chiefs acknowledged that 
the Russians were now going to provide protection to the Kashaya from other people who had previously attacked them, such as Miwoks and other Pomo triblets, and would safeguard them against the Spanish. They were presented with a silver medal, which had the Russian imperial emblem and the inscription, Allies of Russia. This was the only treaty with native peoples that was never broken. Ivan Kuskov built Ross on the Ostroh model with a square-shaped enclosure, but his concerns proved to be groundless. The Kashaya were friendly hosts, and the Spanish would ultimately never attack the settlement. Eventually, the Russians would refer to Ross as Settlement Ross or Colony Ross. Only the Spanish, who saw the Russian outpost as a threat, referred to the site as Fort Ross. So, who was employed at the fort? Prakashnike, those would be administrative assistants and work supervisors. Um, artisans of various kinds were involved. And Promishlenike, these were laborers, uh, hunters. There were, you know, people that had other sets of skills that were still deemed important. And often they, these folks were paid in company scrip. At least that started after 1820. And that meant if you want to buy clothes, if you want to buy flour or meat, you're buying from the company store. It's interesting that any of the native Californians that were working were also able to, well, they were actually paid in flour and meat and other goods. So a little bit different system for the Russians and the Creoles that happened to be living at the fort and working there. If you've been following along with my Mission Odyssey series, and when you see me put on the fedora, you're going to expect me to play anthropologist. After all, it's what I got a degree in. So I have to trot that out occasionally. And you would expect uh, me to say, well, who was living in the Fort Ross area? And the answer you would normally expect would be the Kashaya Pomo and some of the Miwok who were over by Drake's Bay. And that would be part of the answer, but that's not all of it. But the population at Fort Ross is going to be a lot more diverse than you think. Yeah, there's Russians there. It's Russian California. But there's a lot more to it than that. There's, okay, it's out of maybe the 260 people that were actually physically living at Fort Ross. Um, there were 38 of them who were Russians, except they're not all Russians. They're representing the breadth of the and depth of the Russian Empire. So you'll have Ukrainians, you'll have Poles, Belarusians, you'll have Latvians, you'll have Lithuanians, you, and there'll be uh, Baltic Germans living there, and Tatars, and all that representation. When Kuzkov did his census, he noted that there were also 130 native Alaskans. Some were Aleuts and some, many were lumped under a name Kodiak. There were also five Yakuts from Siberia. There were four native Hawaiians who were there. Uh, also a number of Creoles, so, you know, mixed uh, marriages going on there. And most of these people are male, which meant that there is a lot of interaction with the women in the area, and there were a lot of marriages, and sometimes these were noted as marriages, and sometimes these would be noted in records as this was Yvonne's woman because maybe Yvonne was married back in Russia and this would be a 
second wife and that would not really look good in the eyes of Eastern Orthodox. So the population is a lot more diverse than people could imagine. Gabriel Moraga, the soldado stationed at El Presidio de San Francisco, who had explored much of Northern California, had been in the uh, Russian Californian area before he'd been at Bodega Bay. He would make three more trips to the Russian held territory. In 18... 13, he came back t this time to Fort Ross and he brought with him cattle and horses and these were offered as gifts. He also brought trade items and he intended to or he was made the agent for uh, beginning trade between the uh, Spanish in Alta California and the Russians in, Al in Northern California and the thing is, you know, Spain didn't like this at all. They practiced basically a type of mercantilism where they did not want their colonies dealing with the outside world. They were only to deal with Spain. Well, here's Moraga bringing these gifts and then the trade items. And so a trade developed. Well... Mexico City got wind of this and the Russian American company was ordered to vacate Northern California and they didn't and guess what the trade continued why it was beneficial for Alta California who were so dependent upon one ship per year that came from Mexico to help supply them and offer trade items. And sometimes that ship didn't show up. And it benefited the Russians. And so they kept the trade going until Mexican independence because, hey, Mexico City was far away. After independence, then there's gonna be some problems. All right, let's see what's inside this place that the Spanish were afraid of. Okay, there's a blockhouse where cannons would be. All right, that's fair. Okay, there's a gate, a chapel, a couple of cannons. Okay, three cannons, the manager's house or the Kuskov house, another blockhouse, a warehouse, and the office. More properly, that's the official's quarters. So let's take a look inside the official's quarters. This would probably be where the prekashchike or the administrative assistants and work supervisors would be doing their work. Okay, so there's the common mess area. And let's see. All right, got the kitchen with a whitewashed oven. So that means it probably needed lime to do that. And a pantry. There's a samovar. Okay, and over here we've got a door. An office. Probably for one of the administrative assistants. Okay, sleeping quarters. Oh, Hudson Bay blankets. All right. Oh, icons. In every Slavic home, there would be an area where icons would be put up that was called the beautiful corner or the red corner. Okay, another set of quarters and let's see what else we got in here okay this has changed woodworking shop so maybe the artisans are living in here or i know they at least seem to have one shop okay that's woodworking okay that's metalworking. All right, we solved that mystery. Okay, there's the old warehouse where I would imagine the pelts that had been harvested would be stored. And there's a new warehouse and a clothing warehouse. Oh, with a jail. Cool. 
across the compound from the old warehouse used to be the barracks. Well, there's a display in the Kuskov house which shows the weapons and the gunpowder and stuff for the artillery. But that kind of gives you, yeah, there's an idea about a military presence here. As far as where the uh, the workers, uh, the laborers, the hunters, the seamen, where they were living, a lot of them were living outside of the compound, but they might have been initially living there. Let's take a look at the old commandant's house, or now it's the Kuskov house, located on the highest ground. Everybody in the vicinity of Fort Ross was in the service of the RAC. The colony was headed by an office manager who was paid a salary, provided with living quarters, and even though provided with servants, often worked as hard as anyone else. Four of the five managers of the Ross settlement lived in this house. Ivan Kuskov for nine years, Karl Ivanovich Schmidt for four, Pavel Ivanovich Shelnikov for five, Peter Stepanovich Kostromitinov for approximately eight years. Huh. The second floor could be barricaded. Those are doors. The office manager's office. And there's the traditional red corner or beautiful corner where all the icons go. I'm inside one of the blockhouses now. So there were two blockhouses. One was seven-sided, one was eight-sided, which would have made me crazy trying to do the math for that. And a number of cannons, small ones, on each floor. And there, let's see in this one, there's one, two, three, four, five openings in the one that I'm currently standing in for cannons on the top floor. And I think there were four down below. And so if the walls were ever breached, this was a place to retreat to, and this could be barricaded fairly well. Outside this window, there was a road that the Russians built to the cove. The Russian ships would anchor in the cove below. The baidarkas or kayaks, some people might slip and call them canoes. They were dried on racks above the beach. The blacksmith shop, the cooperage, and boat works were also located on the bluff. Okay, so I'm in the northern blockhouse. It's a seven-sided one, I counted. And there's six openings for artillery. So, but I don't happen to see any cannons up here. There's a really cool line of fire though that I have to show you. The opening of the fort or one of the three gates is being defended by the cannon that would be here. By about 1824, there were roughly 400 Russian families living along that uh, small stretch of the California coastline. And the next year, the Fort Ross Chapel was built by Vasily Gurdinin, the shipwright responsible for the construction of the four ships built at Fort Ross. Although never consecrated as a church due to the tenuous legal nature of the colony and that there was no clergyman ever permanently assigned, the Russian, Creole, and Aleut colonists conducted prayer meetings in the chapel, designated a sexton for its upkeep, and hosted several priests for brief visits the longest being three months. Oh, I knew it. I'm still not done. Hope you stick with me.